a couple weeks ago, we just celebrated our 25-year anniversary. Yeah. And it was so good. Um, we're in Lake Tahoe, California, just for a couple of days and just praying and thinking about everything God's done in our lives over these 25 years. Um, just in our prayer times, we just kept thanking God because we feel like we're the most blessed people on the earth. Um, we love our children very much. We love each other very much. Um, and uh, I'm gonna let her speak quite a bit because my throat's going anyways, and she's a better speaker than I am. Oh, right. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I did wanna share a couple of thoughts. Um, where my notes went, oh yeah. About, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited that, I, that there are a lot of singles in the room. You know, we're gonna be talking about marriage and parenting, but so often I feel like we're helping people after they've already made so many mistakes. And so it's nice to be with some singles um, also who you're, you're going into this world and you're, you're, you're thinking about, you're contemplating, you're pursuing marriage and um, maybe to avoid some of the mistakes because we, we got such bad advice um, when we first got married and I feel like so many people told us, oh, it's gonna be so difficult, you know, the first month and then the first year is gonna be really tough, and then, oh yeah, there's this thing called the seven-year itch that's horrible, and then there's, a, once you have a baby, that's gonna be a tough year, and, and oh, the two-year-old stage is the worst. If you have a two-year-old, all of these things people told us, and so we went into marriage almost afraid of some of these things and expecting, and every year we'd be like, gosh, when is it gonna get bad? Because this is pretty good, you know? And it just kept getting better and better and with every child and two-year-old, like terrible, two, that's like our favorite age, you know? And, and, and with every child, it just seems like the Lord has blessed us more and more and more. And I'm not saying that there won't be difficulties in your marriage, but something that we've learned is that it really starts with what I was talking about this morning about knowing the Lord and like I was sharing like when you're alone with him you know like like Psalm 23 says he says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want like when I'm alone with God I am so full like I'm like God, life can't get any better. I am in the presence of you. And like the psalmist says, um, he says, my cup is overflowing. So that's the way I feel when I'm alone with God is like I'm so full. Picture a, a cup up here and it's, and it's overflowing and just splashing over. Like that's the way I feel when I'm with the Lord every morning. So when I get out of my prayer time, I am spilling over. And so when I see my children, uh, that love is spilling over onto them. When I see my wife, that love is spilling over because I'm not, too many people walk around like an empty cup and, and they're, they're like wanting something from you. They're unfulfilled, they're unfilled. And, 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 and some of you, maybe you're, you're single and you're, you're unfulfilled, your life doesn't feel full, and so you think that, okay, but once I find the right person, then it's gonna be great. And it's like, no, no, Lisa will never be able, as amazing as she has been, she'll never be able to fill me the way God intends to the way God created me to be filled. That comes only from the Lord. And we see so many people fighting in their marriages, and it's because they're empty people. It's, it's, it's almost like, a, it's, it's almost like a, years ago I went scuba diving. How many have gone scuba diving? Has anyone gone scuba diving here? Okay, six of you. Okay, but... Uh, it's not a big thing. I figure with the ocean, you might do it. Okay, but um, 
it's, it's kind of terrifying, it's kind of cool though. But you know, you have this mask, and I remember going way down and thinking, oh man, if this thing fails, I will die, right? Like, I can't get back up in time. So we were going down this thing called this um, blue hole where we're down like 75, 100 feet down. And, and they told me, they go, when you get to about 65 feet down, it'll feel like you're on drugs, like your mind because of the nitrogen or something like this. So I'm a little scared, you know? And so I get down to that part and I'm like, I just began to panic because I thought, if this mask does not work, this is all of my oxygen. And I began to panic a little bit, and I told my, my friend who was the instructor, I'm like, get me up, get me up, because I got scared. And he was like, he's like, up, you know, because you can't talk, you know, because you're in the water, you know. And, uh, and, um, and I was like, then I was like, wait, 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 wait. And I just relaxed and I thought, no, you know what, Lord? Even when I'm above water, I'm dependent on you to breathe every second. So it doesn't matter that I'm 100 feet underwater right now. I'm okay. And I told the instructor, let's keep going down. You know, let's, let's go down. And, but I, I, I think about that oxygen tank and how much, how dependent I am on it. And it's almost like in some marriages, people don't have their own tank. And so if there was just one tank between us, we would have to like keep sharing it back and forth, back and forth. Oh, I need air. No, I need air. I need it more than you. I need it more than you. And that's what I see in so many marriages. But if you both have your own tank, if you're both filled from the Lord and you have your own air supply, your life supply, then you just swim together. You live life together. Like I'm not a needy person that needs so much from Lisa. And in the same way, she's not this needy woman that just depends on me for all of her security and, and everything else. It's like, we're good before the Lord. We love the Lord. And so same with our kids. You know, sometimes I see parents that almost want to try to live through their children and they almost have children for themselves because they need a friend or they need whatever. And, and again, it's almost like sucking all the life out of your children because you yourself need something from them because you're unfulfilled. And so I guess one of the most important things that I could say about this and the 25 years, this has been amazing. Um, I'm not exaggerating. Until meeting Peter and Diana, I really thought there's no family like ours in the world. We've got, you know, then I meet them, I'm like, oh wow, this is weird. They're actually really cool, you know, and their whole family and everything. So it's a very special thing I think the Lord is doing here with that model and with that example. We feel very much the same way where our children are involved with us in ministry and so full of life and there's so much joy. In fact, uh, you didn't hear this, but uh, one of the sons, I, I get them mixed up because they have a lot of kids too, um, was talking about how they were just in Lake Tahoe a few, uh, a couple, a few weeks ago and um, they took all of the kids and he was asking me, you know, how do you help your kids with electronics? And I said, well, we took that vacation to Tahoe and we told our kids, because we don't want them addicted to, you know, so many kids are just on their iPads and phones all day. And we told our kids, nothing electronic for the whole vacation. Okay, so I don't want to see a cell phone, I don't want to see an iPad, I don't want to see a laptop, nothing. We're just gonna hang out and talk like human beings. We're gonna laugh and play in the snow, we're gonna do this and this is, and you know, so for like four days, just nothing. And we had the best time. 
And I found out they did the same thing with their kids. I mean, all these things that I go, no one does this, you know. And the Tanchis do. They beat us in everything. So it's, it's just, it, it, but, but I, I, I just, this, this love, this family, I, I just, I want, I, I want this to not be a rarity. You know, like this should be the norm of Christian families. And it's not. But I think it starts with this joy in the Lord and being a spirit-filled husband and wife because there's only one spirit. So like I've said, there has never been a spirit-filled couple that has gotten divorced. In all of history, there has never been a spirit-filled couple that has gotten a divorce. Every divorce is because one or maybe both of the partners are not spirit-filled and are not living the spirit-filled life. Why? Because there's only one spirit. And so if I am seeking that one spirit and Lisa is seeking that one spirit, guess what? We're gonna come to the same conclusions. It's those times when one of us is acting in the flesh and just thinking about ourselves rather than what he wants, that everything falls apart. One last thought, and then I'm going to have her share, is uh, so I'm 51, and last year I had a 50th birthday party, but I told my wife, I hate parties. Like, I don't want any parties for me, you know? Um, but for my 50th, I go, here's what I want to do. I would like to gather people together to pray. And, and as my birthday present, can we just ask people to fast that day for me? You know? And, and just pray for me all day. And I say, pray that this next season of my life, I'll grow so close to Jesus and pray that during this next phase of my life, I would really hear from him and where he's directing me in ministry. Like this would be the greatest present to me. This would be the greatest party, is if people could just come and lay hands on me and pray for me. So that's what we did for our 50th, uh, for my 50th, she's not 50 yet, obviously. She's, she's still only 25. And, uh, but, uh, as they prayed for me and everything else, it was a wonderful time just having my children lay hands on me and pray for me and my friends there praying for the power of the Spirit in my life for the next season of life. But one of my friends afterwards, he's about 35 years old, he told me, he goes, you know, your 50th birthday was so powerful. He goes, I decided at your 50th birthday that that's what I want to be when I'm 50. He goes, I want to be you when I'm 50 years old. That's my goal. And I said to him, I go, man, I'm flattered. That's, that's, that's you know, I'm honored by that. I go, here's the problem. You're not making the same decisions I made when I was 35. So you're not going to be like me when you're 50. The choices you make now, you can't just say, oh, when I'm 49, then I'll be like Francis was when he's 50 and I'll put. No, you have to make the decisions now. You make the choices now. You don't just become this, you know, 50-year-old with this great family and everyone's loving the Lord because you just, you, you, you flip the switch at 49. No, it's, it's a lifetime of decisions. And so some of you that are earlier on in marriage were hoping that you would make some of those decisions that, that people never told us about. And people didn't, that's why we wrote our book, You and Me Forever, because I thought no one talks about this stuff. They're not thinking about eternity. They're not thinking about how, how if you read the Bible, if you just read everything that Jesus said about family, I think you'd be shocked. I mean, do it sometime. Go through the New Testament and write down, just go through the Gospels 
and write down every time Jesus mentions family. I think you'll be surprised what he says. Compare that to what you'll find in the normal Christian bookstore about marriage. Because Jesus wasn't all about, oh, you know, family first, safety first, take care of this, this. No, he's, his words were more, if anyone loves their wife or kids more than they love me, they're not worthy to be my disciple. Unless you're willing to hate, unless you hate your father, mother, wife, you're not worry, worthy to be my disciple. He was explaining, look, in heaven, there's no marriage. This is a brief thing here. So marriage is sacred. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's created by God. But he also explains it needs to take its rightful place. That as much as I love my wife, as much as I love my kids, my walk with the Lord is far above that. And that's what makes the marriage wonderful. It's the byproduct of knowing him. Amen. Amen. You want to share a little bit? Wow. I'll sit down. And... That, was good. that was a good word. Thank you. Um, it's interesting because we hadn't really talked about today, and um, that was what was on my heart was how much you have to think about what you want to be because things don't just happen. Um, yeah, basically what you just said. <laughs> oh, is that what you were going to share? I really was. Oh, okay. Do you so have anything you else stole to share? It. <laughs> I told you you could go first. <laughs> but he's the leader, and I said, I think you should go first you, you, so that you will show them that you are the leader and yeah. I'm the follower. Um, yeah, we have done a lot of counseling in our years of ministry, and and I think the Lord has revealed to us over time that, you know, a person or a couple will walk in the door and they will share with you what's going on, what their issue is. And it's so easy to look and listen at what they are saying to you about this other person or about their problem. And I feel like God has just done this beautiful thing of I don't care who it is and what the circumstance is. The one thing I want to start with is what's going on between you and Christ. It's everything that Francis was sharing this morning. Like, I need to know first, where is your love for God? What is your time like in the Word? Are you listening to the voice of His Spirit speaking to you? Are you responding in obedience? Is there a relationship that is very true and real and intimate? Because 10 times out of 10, when they are walking in with bitterness, rage, anger, just so many issues, and I say, where are you at with Christ? And they're like, well, you know, I, I give them a, give me a number between one and 10. Where would you say your relationship is at? And it's always on the bottom end of the scale. Always. Because we think that our issues are the issue when really it's what's going on between you and God. And I, I just really believe that God wants you to get that somehow, to realize that when things are off, that's why even when he was speaking and he was saying, you know, he's got to be filled up or else I'm going to be, when I'm needy, which you guys, it's not like I am always perfectly filled up. My cup is not always full. So what I do in that moment is not, I mean, for a, maybe for a little second, I'm looking at, you know, what he's not doing. You guys, he's not as perfect as you think he is. <laughs> Close. He's awesome, okay, but he's not perfect. So it would be easy for me in that, those moments to run through my list of what he's not doing or why he's not meeting my needs. But again, because of what the Lord has revealed to us, and the more you read the word, you can't escape it. I feel like the Lord is saying, look at your own heart, Lisa. What's going on here? And I choose to take it to heart and say, 
okay, first I've got to go be with the Lord and make things right. I need the Lord to get my heart in the right place because then I will know how to respond to my husband and to pray for my husband and maybe to go and apologize to my husband or to be able to genuinely share my concern or my hurt and say, hey, when this happened, you know, there's some communication and honesty, but my heart is in a better place because I've taken it to the Lord first. And so... I'm just really, really feeling like God wants us to remember that all of our issues start spiritually. So when you are lacking, when you are struggling, when you find yourself overwhelmed, first go to the Lord. Don't run to the counselor, to the friend, to anyone else. But just remember just how much. I I tell this illustration sometimes that I heard from a woman years ago about this banquet table that the Lord sets out. If you were invited to an awesome banquet with every Filipino amazing delicacy that you guys like lumpia, right? Uh, Or what's the little candy? Balut, (laughs) yeah. Francis actually ate balut. Um, But everything is on this banquet table and you're invited to come in and eat. And this is, we're talking about God. If God says, I have a banquet table for you. So this whole table is filled with forgiveness, grace, love, um, wisdom, kindness, mercy. And the Lord says, you can come and take as much as you need, as often as you need, and yet, we will choose to walk around like, well, I just don't have time to sit down, you know? So we wonder why we're so hungry and empty and spiritually unfulfilled. And she even gave this picture of someone crawling around under the table, picking up crumbs from other people who are sitting at the table. You're thinking, wow, look at Pastor Peter. He's sitting at that table. He's just just filling himself with all that good food. And you sit under the table taking a couple crumbs when God is like, no, you sit at the table. This is for you, my son, my daughter. It's all for you. You can have it. That is literally what the the death of Christ did for us was give us access to all the goodness and the promises that God provides for us. That's why as children of God, we can live our lives in a totally different way than the world. It's the people of the world that should feel all that emptiness. So why are we not going and sitting and partaking of the banquet that God has given to us and promised to us and longs to give us? It's ludicrous, right? And we need to see it that way. Like, man, that is ridiculous. I have access to the most amazing feast Every day, every hour. I love that song that says, you know, Lord, I need you. I need you. Every minute, every hour, I need you. So please remember that you have an invitation from God and go and get what you need. I've heard so many stories of you that have really lacked in your relationship with your mom or your dad. But you know what? It's the enemy that wants to just keep telling you that you haven't been given what you need and that you are still lacking. And that is not true. You are not lacking a single thing because you are a child of God. And you have got to believe what his word says over any other person, and especially the voice of the enemy who wants to kill and steal and destroy. That is all he is about. Do not let him steal what God wants to do in your life. Man, I just want to see victory in those of us who call ourselves Christians. Because it's not okay for us to keep living these defeated lives. It doesn't make any sense for us to live in defeat. We were just gathered with a bunch of our women leaders 
back home and this young woman shared this beautiful connection when she was talking about the Israelites just before they were going to go into the promised land. And you guys know the story. The spies are sent over to look at the land, right? And what are they afraid of? The giants. There's giants in the land. You know what? The land is amazing. It's so awesome. But there's giants, so we can't do it. There was only two who was like, you guys, it's amazing. Who cares about the giants? We have God. He's going to give us the victory. Do you remember why it's called the promised land? Because he promised it to us. Mm. It's a promise. So why are you worried about the giants? Why are you even talking about them? We have God. He's already told us that we will have victory. Mm. And this girl says, you know, we're talking about, well, we need to break the chains of this bondage, these things in our lives, these lies, these things from our past, addictions, sin, whatever it is. She's like, we're just like those Israelites. We're standing there looking at what we need to overcome, what we need to try to forgive or forget, stop doing, start doing. And she says, we're praying and asking God to break those chains when he has already broken them. You are already free. You need to walk into the promised land. There's nothing holding you back. You are not shackled anymore. So it is unbelief. It is unbelief that is keeping you from going into the promised land. It's on you. It is not on him because he has already set you free. Isn't that the most amazing news? Mm. There's the promised land and you are already free. Don't be like those Israelites. Oh, we are just such sinful people. We're so in need of being reminded of the truth. I hope that the spirit in you is going, oh my gosh, that's right. Why am I so filled with unbelief. We should be crying out for bigger and stronger and truer faith. I've been asking for it all the time now, and God is answering. He's a good father. He wants to give good gifts to his children. So when we pray for these things, we can know that he will respond and answer and listen. Ask him for faith to believe the work he has already done to set you free, to believe that the promised land is yours and you can walk in victory and freedom. You know, it's, it's interesting. I'm thinking as I'm listening to my wife speak that and people said this about our book too. They go, it's not really a marriage book in a lot of ways. It's it's, it seems like it's more about your relationship with God. And I go, yeah, that's exactly it. Because most of your marriage problems are not marriage issues. They're God issues. It's because you lack in your relationship with God that you're driving your spouse crazy. It's because you don't really understand the forgiveness in Christ that you can't forgive your spouse. It's that, that these are the things, that's, that's the issue. And at the same time, when you are filled with him, then this is easy. It really is. When you are fulfilled in Christ and you are full, it's, it's like, you, ever, you know, when you go to a buffet and, you know, everything's just saying you've just eaten so much, you're not going to fight over that last piece of cake. You're just like, you eat it. No, you eat it. I had too much. That's the way we feel in our walk with the Lord. Like, I don't need anything from you. You don't need anything from me. Then just, let's just go. Our cups are both overflowing, and so we've been able to bless other people in our lives. I think that's part of the sadness, too, is we've seen so many of our friends that because they're not filled up in Christ, then they start having marriage issues, and then they're no testimony to the rest of the world. Um, they, they don't have the life to help other people. And I hear so many people say, well, we can't serve in the church right now because we're having so many problems between us. We need counseling first. And we hear this all of the time. And that's the way Satan is, uh, 
destroying the ministry in so many ways is by affecting our marriages. Um, I did want to say something. Um, as Lisa was talking, it's very easy to just start talking about relationships and, um, and neglect that there's bigger issues in this room. Um, like I said this morning, I'm sure that there are some of you in this room that are in immoral relationships. Some of you right now, even as you sit in this room where we're worshiping God Almighty, you're sleeping with someone that you are not married to. And I know in the world that's not a big deal, and I know that there's a lot of that going on in the Philippines, and in fact, some of that is the reputation, um, is that there's just a lot of sleeping around, and there's a lot of people who don't get married, a lot of singles that just figure, you know what, I'll just have you know, kids with different guys or whatever else, and, and weddings are so expensive, we can't even save up to have that, so let's just sleep around and do this or that, and I, I just want to remind you what God says about that. Like, pe people always tell me, well, you know, a sin is a sin. I'm like, ah, not really. Um, because when God speaks about immorality, he speaks about it differently. He says, uh, gosh, now I can't find it. Is it 1 Corinthians 6? Um, oh, yeah. 1 Corinthians 6, he says, Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. He explains that every other sin you commit is outside of your body. Okay, so I get it. Yes, the Bible teaches if you're guilty of one sin, you are guilty of all of them. That is biblical. But it is also biblical what he says here, that the other sins you commit are outside of your body, and there is something different about having sex outside of marriage. He says, because you're sinning against your own body. And, and it's a very graphic picture. He goes, don't you know, like Ephesians 5, one of the beautiful things is he says that I am a member of the body of Christ. See, we say that like no big deal. Yeah, I'm a member of the body of Christ. Think about what that means. He says he nourishes and cherishes it just like you would a part of your body. Like right now I have this pain in my bicep. I can't, I can't lift things because I have like this torn something. I, I don't understand the body, but I, you know, but my whole body's like, oh, it's really bothering me. Like I, I can't lift things with my left arm. And, it's, and so I, I care for it. I rub it. I try, it's a part. It's attached. And the Bible says that I am attached to Christ? Are you kidding me right now? The God of the universe, 
that he looks at me like I look at my own arm. And he says, Francis, you're a member of me. And that's why Paul says in Corinthians, he goes, so I'm going to take a member of Christ? So you being attached to Jesus, you dare sleep with someone who is not your spouse? Are you crazy? He says, you're attached to Jesus. That means when you go into the bed with that whore, you are bringing Jesus with you. He says, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now you're forcing Jesus into a union that he wants no part of. It's, this pic it's a really ugly picture of you're, your, in a sense, raping God. You're forcing him into a sexual relationship he wants nothing, no part of. I know the world says, oh, you're in love. It's so beautiful. No, God is disgusted by it. And he says, you're going to take me and force me into a union with this man or this woman that I want nothing of? He goes, that's disgusting. How dare you do that to me? And then you're going to walk into a church gathering and sing to him? Okay, that is just disgusting. And if that is you, man, don't come back. Not till you repent. Turn away from that. Gosh, yeah, that, it, it, it hurts the church. But man, I hope, and some of you guys go, wow, you're really strong on this. No, because the Lord is very strong on it. This is so sickening to him. I mean, you've got to understand, too, for some of you guys, like, if you dare take one of his daughters, okay, and you sleep with one of God. Okay, I have five daughters. I have five daughters. Would any of you think to sleep with one of my daughters outside of marriage and then come to my house and try to be my buddy? Are you kidding me? You slept with one of my daughters. Are you kidding me right now? You dare sleep with one of my girls and think that we'll just be friends. That's me as a human being. I would tear you up. And so imagine God who, holy, 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 holy God, who loves his daughters even more than that, and you are going to defile one of them and then pray to him? You're insane. That is so evil, so wicked. And I will say, though, there's forgiveness for that, okay? But you need to repent. You need to walk away from that. You need to confess that to the Lord the crazy thing is the Lord will forgive you probably better than I would, okay? But he will also punish a lot worse than I would. And I'm just telling you, please, for your sake and for the sake of his church and for his bride, I'm tired of hearing about people in ministry and people in these churches they're living the same way that they do out in the world. It's ugly. It's ugly. Some of the decisions we made early on. I was a virgin when I got married at 26. Because I became a Christian pretty early on in my teen years and realized, man, and I'm not saying I was perfect in any way. Man, I was like every other guy, the temptation, everything else but at least kept that part for marriage. Lisa, same thing. Maintained herself, kept herself. We made, a we made decisions early on 
out of our walk with the Lord so that when I put that ring on her finger, she could know that, look, I saved myself for you. And so that's why when I'm gone traveling or whatever, she knows she can trust me because you know what? I showed her that. And even when we were engaged and all the passion there and everything else, it's like, no, I'm going to show self-control, you know? And because I want her to know that I'm a man of self-control. And you can trust me when I put that ring on your finger and I say there will be no other. I meant that. And the same vice versa. These are the decisions you make at a young age. And they continue on. And that's why you can say when you're 50 years old, man, this has been good. And you can say after 25 years of marriage, this is insanely good. Everything has been so good, you know? <clears throat> but it's decisions you make today. And it's true, I understand. In a group this size, many of you have already made those mistakes. But I'm telling you, there's forgiveness. And not only that, but there's redemption. Because maybe, you, maybe you're single here and you've already committed this, this disgusting act with someone else. And, but maybe you hear this message and you realize how disgusting it is in God's eyes and you actually repent. What a beautiful thing to be able to say on your wedding day to your spouse, look, I heard this message and I heard the word of God and I was so convicted about my life that I turned it around and I kept myself pure from this day on. And to be able to give that gift and to show that that's really the Holy Spirit in your life, changing the way you think and changing the way that you lived. And uh, I, I, I hope that's true. I hope that will happen to some of you today. But I had to throw that out there because I was just stirring in me that I'm just going, you know what? We can talk about this relationship with God and everything else, but let's just, let's just cut to the chase. Um, you can't have a relationship with him and continue in that type of immorality, just like you cannot rape one of my daughters and expect to have a relationship with me. It's just not going to happen. You've got to pick, you've got to choose. Yeah, the verse that comes to mind is, set your mind on things above, not on things of this world. And husbands, if you're listening, do you want to know the most wonderful thing you can do for your wife? It's to set your mind on things above. And to set the tone of your home on things above, not the things of this world. I tell Francis very regularly <laughs> that that is the thing I am most grateful for that he is a man who has led me and our children towards the, th the things above. <clears throat> you know, where is your treasure? Is your treasure here? Because wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. So if your treasure is here on earth, if this is what you're living for, then by all means, you're going to do what thou wilt. You're just going to do what you want. And there's going to be a lot of pain and sin and ugliness that comes from that. But if you set your mind on things above and you store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where nothing can destroy it or touch it or take it away. There's so many times when Francis will sit the kids and I down and he'll say, this is the decision that we're making because we're not ever going to regret this in light of eternity, in light of what's coming. We're not going to live for this world. And he just sets that tone over and over and over again. So I just want to say to you husbands, step it up and set the standard in your home and say, we've got to remember why we're here and who we are here for. It's the whole heart behind why we wrote the book even. 
It was like, we've got to get people thinking, you know what, marriage, nothing is for you. It's not about you. Do you need to hear that all the time? Because I do. I think about myself way too much. And I'm just willing to bet that you're probably just like me. You think of you more often than anyone else. What do I want? What do I need? What do I want to get? Where do I want to go? It's always me, me, me. So even in marriage, even in singleness with deciding, well, I want this and I want that. God, what do you want? God, do you want me to be single? Well, then I, the verse that came to me, very, the first one for you guys last night was Colossians 3, verse 17. And it says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And I'm like, well, that's kind of a weird verse, Lord, but not really. <laughs> whatever you do. You mean even marriage? Have you guys, when is the last time you considered, you know what, this marriage, I'm doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And a little bit further down in, in verse 23, it rewords it a little bit. It says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Here he's talking about your work, because he literally was talking about slaves in verse 22. Obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Like, he's just bringing it down into every part of your life. You could go to your job and you've got the worst boss ever and you hate your job, but you choose to do it as unto the Lord because that's what we're called to as believers. It doesn't matter what earthly things you see or are involved in. Your circumstances are not what define you. You do your work as unto the Lord because you fear God. And in the same way in marriage, it's like we just need a, a new perspective. We just need a mind shift. Like this marriage, I'm so about myself in this marriage. All I'm thinking about is what I need and what I want and what I wish he or she was like or what he or she would do for me. <laughs> and you're not thinking this marriage is for Christ. I want to work in my marriage as unto the Lord. And that changes your whole motivation. You guys, Francis will not always motivate me to do what is right. Sometimes he does because he's a pretty good husband. But what about when you have a husband who's not so great? Do you get like the get out of jail free card that you don't have to be a loving wife or a loving husband? You know, God calls us to something deeper and greater as believers. No, do everything as unto the Lord. So the first thing you have to do in your marriage is remember that it is not about you. It is about Christ and it is for Christ. And if you look in Colossians 3, starting in verse 12, it just gives this beautiful passage that I think you can just so take to heart as a preaching for all of us, but especially for marrieds. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, see, it starts with your identity always. You are someone who has been chosen of God, and you are holy and beloved. That, remember, your source, your cup. You're already holy and beloved, and you are a child mm. of God. Mm. Then he goes to what you do. Then out of that, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. 
When is the last time it was in your heart to say when someone offended you, God, give me the grace to forgive them as you have forgiven me? That's the most amazing forgiveness of all because we deserve none of his forgiveness. He's perfectly holy and he has never offended us. And we offend him over and over again. And his forgiveness is there and it's real. And he says, forgive as I have forgiven you. That is a word for you guys to take to heart because there is another passage in scripture that says, if you do not forgive, I will not forgive you. God is very serious about this. And listen, if you are going to enter into a marriage relationship, you will need to forgive. Mm. You cannot be in a relationship with any other person for any length of time and not need forgiveness. Can I hear anyone say amen? I don't care if it's your child, your sister, your mother, your brother. Man, we offend one another. We are sinful people. And we just want to be this fountain of forgiveness and grace to offer to people, I forgive you. Yes, I will forgive you. And to pray and ask God for the ability to forgive when we don't feel it. But man, if you could just take this test, maybe on your own, you can ask yourself, you can ask your spouse. Here's where I rate myself in putting on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and that forbearing spirit, forgiveness. Man, where are you at with that? that we could just sit for a good hour and, and deal with some things with the Lord, right? And maybe it's time to have that conversation. There are times in our relationship, not, I don't know, maybe every couple years or during an anniversary, we'll sit and say, hey, if there's one thing I could do differently or better, like how can I be a better wife or what do you see that I need to work on? And man, that just like builds humility into your life. Because guess what? I don't ever want to hear what I'm doing wrong or what I need to work on. <laughs> but if I'm asking for it in humility and I'm saying, hey, can you tell me where, where do I need to work? What am I doing? Have I offended you in any way? And build that heart of compassion and kindness and gentleness, humility, which is so precious to God and is so necessary for any relationship that we are in. <laughs> when she was talking, uh, we're hitting a lot of really heavy things. And it's kind of like when we were writing the book, how I was like, wow, this sounds really heavy. And there's this other side too of just the Lord says how he gave us everything to enjoy. And I don't want you guys to walk away thinking, gosh, Francis and Lisa, they probably just at home preaching to each other all day. <laughs> because we're just like, yeah, and this. And, and if you're sleeping with someone, you're going to hell. You know, like, it, it's, it's, it's like so much of our marriage is just laughter you know, with the kids and enjoying each other because it is such a beautiful, beautiful thing that God created. And even, yeah, I, I wanna apologize, even like a lot of times in the church when we come to the area of uh, sexual immorality, like we talk about that and, and yet it's almost like we can look at that as a negative thing, um, sex itself. And we forget, like, there's so many things that are distorted in our, in our world that Satan is almost taking the glory, you know, trying to take that glory away from God when God created something so beautiful in marriage. And that's what we want for you is, like, there can be so much joy, but it, it comes with repentance. And even, you know, let's just be honest, like, like, like sex is awesome. You know, like it's just, it's not like that was from Satan. It's not like God created Adam and Eve and then he was like, 
hey, what are you doing? Get off her. You know, no, it's, this was his creation. You know, it was amazing. You know, he says, whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, it all for the glory of God. We have a God who's so creative, so beautiful, so amazing. I mean, we were talking about eating earlier. Isn't eating just the best? You know, like that taste in your mouth. I mean, God could have created it in such a way that we're like the plants and we just suck dirt into our feet and like, hmm. Oh, I've got energy now. Mm. But instead, in his glory, he goes, no, I'm going to make food, and you're going to taste it, and you're going to love it. And it's in the same way, you know, he could have said, well, we need to procreate, so I'll have you touch her forehead, and she'll become pregnant. You know, but no, he's like, no, I got a better one. Okay, and it's that whole idea of him. You just go, God, that's amazing. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so in the same way with, with marriage, let's not let the enemy, like, steal this thing. You have so many young people that are dreading and terrified of, oh, I don't know if I want to get married because, you know, I know this person's relationship and that person's relationship and this and this and this. And... In reality, this is God's creation. It's beautiful, it's sacred, and when you pursue things His way, it can be so amazing. Um, I can honestly tell you young people, man, 25 years later, like, I desire my wife as much as I did in day one, and probably more so. Yeah, probably more so. I know it's kind of weird to talk about here, but I I go, you know what? That's the way the Lord designed it. It can be this beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, and let's not let the enemy rob us of these wonderful families and marriages and pleasure that we can find in one another. The way I met Lisa was I was working at a church, and she came because she was a singer. She still is a singer. You don't really lose your voice. Um, but uh, she uh, came as a guest soloist, and so I had heard about her, and she was, um, she was kind of a big deal back then. I mean, she still is now, but I mean, <laughs> like, she was, uh, she was uh, the former Miss Teen California, you know, I know, I know, and, uh, and she was like this recording artist and everything else, and Meanwhile, I'm like this pastor that's losing his hair, you know, and I just thought, this girl is definitely out of my league, but it was one of those like desperate, I'm just going to try, I'm going to go for it, you know, I, I just, losing my hair was traumatic. It was like, oh man, I better hurry and find someone. And, uh, my my and, mom did say, you know he's going to lose his hair, don't you? I was like, Mom, you're so shallow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she wasn't thrilled with me. But um, so that's how we met is that she was singing, and uh, I just was blown away by her voice and her beauty. And then, uh, you know, yeah, that's pretty much it. Do you want to know one of the most romantic things that he did that was also very spiritual? <laughs> but it was right before we got married. Um, he gave me a gift, and it was a Bible, and it had my new name on it yet, or my new name, even though we weren't married yet, so it said Lisa Chan, and then he inscribed on the front, you know, just a beautiful letter, like, this is, this is what I want our marriage to be founded on, it's all about Christ, and it was just a beautiful letter. Isn't that so sweet? That was such a good gift. Since you're romantic, I'll tell you that story. Um, I, 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 that was a great question, too, about key, purity. And um, I want to address purity in marriage. Um, we've been married for 25 years. I have never even been in a car alone with another woman. I've never been in a room alone with another woman. Like, I just standards where I don't even allow myself to get into trouble. Um, there's just no opportunity for that. And I think those are some of the decisions you have to make early on 
because you go, look, I, I just, we're all tempted in so many ways. And so even when we were, when, when we were dating, you know, often it was like, hey, let's just go in groups, let's be with other people, let's never be, a, I, I remember uh, I used to have an apartment and um, with, with three other guys and we were all single and we just had that open door policy like you never bring a girl into the room alone and you know, or you know, if you have the door open, we're free to walk in at any time, you know, and so, and we would just to check on each other, you know, we'd trip and pretend we fall in the room, oh, hey, hey, sorry. Um, it was just like, but all of these standards, even when I was single, um, the temptation, even like pornography or whatever else, and there was just that struggle of lust, and I remember even just because I was so convicted before the God of, of wanting to keep this temple pure, I told the Lord, okay, if, if I struggle with lust one day, then I won't eat the next day. Um, and I'll spend the whole day fasting, you know, and just so that all day long I could remember like the sin of the day before and ask God to cleanse me of that. And um, I lost about 15 pounds that way too. <laughs> no, but it was, uh, it, it was just, the Bible talks about like disciplining yourself, you know, for the sake of godliness. And so sometimes we set up these standards in our lives so that it's like, because I want to stay pure in, in your, your eyes. I was just thinking our older girls um, have also brought us in on this whole process. Um, you know, like asking me, mom, I need you. I need to know that you're gonna ask me what we were doing and what our time was like alone because their desire is also for, for purity. Our oldest is married, but um, one of our other daughters is dating a guy very seriously and they're, you know, thinking marriage. And so of course the passion is there. And even this last trip, she just said, mom, I just want to remind you that you need to be asking me and you know, that, that really helps me. And so I'm thinking, wow, that is such a blessing to have your children just say, I want to ask you to speak into my life here and it will help me if I know that you're going to ask. And I'm like, girl, I will be asking. Um, so yeah, just so sweet to try to go through that journey with them, knowing that the struggle is wow. real and that they invite me into it is really precious and I can pray for them and be talking to them about it and it's so good. That's cool, I didn't, I didn't even know that. You didn't? That's pretty cool. She doesn't do that with me. <laughs> I, could, I could see that, that'd be weird with dad. Um, but uh, yeah, because then I would want to beat him up. <laughs> Okay, uh, what was the third but question? But they also make really practical decisions. They're like, we, yeah. have to, we just have to spend a lot of time with other people because if we're alone too much, it's, I mean, it's very obvious, obviously. That's the most uh, significant thing that I would say that they both chose to do was be with other people, just knowing that it is so hard the more time you spend alone. Yeah, you know, also one of our daughters, a different one, um, she was saying the other day, gosh, my friend is so like boy crazy, like it's all she can talk about is boys and she gets all the affection and everything else. And, and I was like, well, honey, you know, <clears throat> I go, I'm very affectionate with you, you know, maybe too much, you know, <laughs> like you're just like, okay, dad, enough, enough. I go, um, but not everyone has a dad that loves them like this. And so let's be careful, you know, with other people that sometimes they're more that way because there's difficulties in the home and, uh, and that they struggle with that. And, and so I want you to know that I, because I don't ever want you to feel unloved by a man, uh, it's very natural for me to love on you and hug on you and everything else. So it's just been fun having these conversations with these girls as they're going through their teen years. I mean, that was another thing that people would tell me that, Oh, once your daughter, you know, once they get to a certain age, you're going to pull away from you. And I've never felt that with any of my daughters. Um, and it's been really fun. You know, like, I could say it, Rachel doesn't care. 
Like, like they said, oh, you know, when she goes through her changes, she's going to pull away from dad, you know. And uh, so I was just kind of expecting that. <laughs> but that's not the relationship I have with my girls. And I remember, like, our oldest, you know, one day when she was going through her changes, she walks in the room. She goes, Dad, your daughter is a 34B now. <laughs> wow, that's weird, okay, you know, but it's just like this relationship where there's just laughter and openness and friendship, and that's what I'm saying is like all of this, uh, it all comes together and be such a beautiful, beautiful thing, and uh, I just, I love my kids so much, and it's so fun to now be a grandfather and still have my oldest daughter you know, whenever I share something with her, she's like, wow, Dad, I still need you. You still have so much wisdom, you know, and I still get cards and texts and everything else, you know. And it's, it's never changed. Like, it's, it's always been like that. And in every phase of their life, it's just been like this intimacy. Because I remember when we first had a, our first child, someone told me about, he says, you know, you've got a little girl, what a gift. And they said, she's going to marry a guy who's just like you. And that was a, a scary thought because you love this child so much that you go, well, then I need to become that man that I would want her to marry. And, and, and they explained to me that, that her picture of God is going to be impacted by their view of you. And so I thought, wow, I represent God to these kids. So that's why from young age on, they respect me. I discipline them. I punish them because I want them to understand that this is the picture of God, a God who disciplines the ones that he loves. I forgive them quickly. I embrace them. I am affectionate with them because I want to show them a dad who is like God, who loves me who wants me to call out Abba Father, who does forgive me, and I know his love is unconditional. Like, I wanna show that to my children. And it's, it's all of things, that's why it's gotta be about God first. And uh, one last thought, and I know we have to go, time's up, is <clears throat> a few years ago, we adopted a girl out of the foster system. Um, she was a teenager and uh, just came from a really messed up background. And <clears throat> the social worker came over one night because her, uh, the girl that was living with us, her sister was, you know, dating guys from gangs and stuff like that, dating, I mean, sleeping around with gangsters. And, uh, and then there were threats against our family for taking in the little girl, like they were saying they were gonna shoot up the house. And so the social worker was like, looked at us and saying, so how much longer can she stay with you knowing that some of these threats could be real? And I remember just looking at this girl and going, honey, I, you can live with us as long as you want. I'm not afraid. I want you to be my daughter. I'll treat you like I treat my other daughters. You see how I treat those girls? That's the way I would treat you. I want you here. And to see her eyes light up and even for me, I was like surprised, like this just effortly came out of my mouth. Like, I want you, you're my daughter, if, if you'll take me, you know? And realizing, wow, Lord, that's the way you are to me. You're a father to the fatherless, and now it's coming out of my mouth. I'm really becoming like you. Like, that's the joy of like what I was talking about this morning when we're children of God. These things come through because we have the seed of God implanted in us. It's, and, and I would just, yeah, amen. I, none of this would have happened on my own. It's the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God inside of us that brings us into the conformity with Christ, and it's when you become that man or woman of Christ that you become a blessing to each other and to your children and to your neighborhood and to the world, 
And so please get right whatever you need to get right. Those of you in immoral relationships, get out of there. Those of you that are battling unforgiveness with your spouse, like, like, like Matthew 6 says, if you don't forgive your brother from the heart, God will not forgive you. That's huge. That should be terrifying to you. Let's repent of these things so the Spirit of God can flow through our families and our families can be a light into the world again. All right. Thanks.